Hello, BookTube. A while ago, Matthew at Mayberry Book Club had an idea for a video, and it could easily have gone wrong. <laughs> we live in the 21st century. We live in the era of thin skins and dra dr drastic operatic overreaction. And he made a video calling out another booktuber, me. <laughs> and so I could easily have misfired. He looked at the books on the shelves in his tiny house and thought, has Steve read all of these books? Are there any here that he hasn't read? Uh, and he made a tag to that effect. He made, a, he made a video, has Steve read this? And it caught on. A whole bunch of people wanted to know the same thing. They were looking at the bookshelves thinking, has Steve read all of these? And that tag ran, ran its course and was tremendous fun. So many people weighed in. Uh, and then it, it sort of went quiescent until Daniel at Guilty Feet came up with the idea of reviving it for season two. And we are now in season two of Has Steve Read It? And quite a few people uh, are joining in. The, the response videos are cropping up almost faster than I can see them. Uh, I believe that Jim at Jim's Books Reading and Stuff has made a playlist and is keeping it and is upkeeping it. If I remember, I'll try and find a link to that and leave it below. Uh, rather than try and find the videos myself. Quite a few people have weighed in. Uh, and I have... Uh, I've had an, an extra layer of interest. I mean, all these responses have been fascinating. But I've had an extra layer of interest for the people who are weighing in twice. Matthew at Mayberry Book Club, for instance, started this whole thing off. And he also took a second bite at the apple. But there are plenty of other people who did videos for season one. And I've been waiting for more of them to show up in season two. And that's what we have today. <laughs> Uh, these have been great fun, absolutely fun, uh, to see not only the stuff that I have read, you know, and talk about it a bit, as though I were just looking at your bookshelves in your home, uh, but also to see stuff that I haven't read, that, that a lot of it is so interesting that it goes straight on my TBR. Uh, but the showing has not been all that good. You get one bean, <laughs> just imagine little schnauzer graphics. You get one bean for every book out on your list that I haven't read. And your list should be eight books long, and it should include no a-hole choices. Nothing that, you know, about root fungi that was written in the 1860s or something like that, where you just search for it online and you know that I haven't read it. The book, it's a fine line, I admit, but the book should, there should be a chance that I've read it and also a chance that I haven't. It's a, it's a, it's a fine line, but we're doing just, you're doing just fine in terms of threading that needle. So, uh... Today we have another returning contestant from season one. We have Kathy Graham from the Grim Reader. I will link, I will leave a link to her video. She wants to, another go at the brass ring here. So let's see how she does. Uh, her first book is The Secrets of Alchemy by Lawrence Princhby. And this is a yes. It is a terrific history of alchemy. It is just an amazingly good book. I'm very glad to know that she has read it and liked it as well. And any of the rest of you who are interested in alchemy, which ruled the physical sciences for centuries, uh, and, you know, we, we think of it now as a totally discredited science that you'd have to be a crackpot to believe in, but when there was nothing else to pursue, some of the smartest people in the world pursued this. And it's good when a history of alchemy is not condescending. It's good when a history of alchemy remembers that fact. Uh, and this one does. So it's, it's a yes and also a recommend. Uh, the next one is Anniversaries by uh, an author that uh, Kathy Grimm refers to as Uwe Janssen. I did not know that that J was a Y. I'll take her word for it. Uh, it but uh, this is it's a gigantic, gigantic work of fiction. And I, it's a yes. It would ordinarily probably not be. As big a fan as I am of gigantic books like The Man Without Qualities or uh, The Demons or something like that, I would probably still have skipped this uh, as being just a little bit too... Uh, in the weeds, a little bit too insider baseball. But the New York Review of Books recently did a very beautiful box set uh, that they sent me. If you're going to do that, I try to read everything I've sent, especially something as intriguing as this. I have not read it before. Uh, and I'm not, I'm again, I'm a big fan of really big, really long books. Uh, but they have to carry the weight. There has to be a reason for it. And I could have taken a knife to this thing easily <laughs> just easily some long books are like that an infinite jest comes to mind some long books are long only because no one stopped the author from just going on and on and this i think is one of those cases i could easily carve this into a 300 page book and i very much could not do that with something like uh well a man without qualities or uh a suitable boy or something like that i, I very much couldn't do that with them 
Uh, and I, th I feel like I could do that with this one. But the, the New York Review Books Classic is such a pretty thing. It's such a nice thing that they did that I, I when I got it, I read it. It took, a, it took a whole weekend to do, but it was worth it. So that's a yes. Uh, the next one, uh, we have several subcategories in these Has Steve Reddit videos. One is a facepalm where I simply cannot believe that the person would would think that I had not read the book that there was any chance that I had not read the book. I know the line is is tricky, like I mentioned, but sometimes, I mean, good Lord. <laughs> uh, that's one. Then there's the multiple face palm, out, like out of the GIF, where there are a whole bunch of contributing factors that make it almost a dead certainty. If I've, if I've reviewed other books by the author, if I've interviewed the author, if I've talked about the author on this channel, and if, even if I haven't mentioned that specific book, that is still a multiple face palm. Then there's what one of you referred to in an email last night as a quantum face palm, which is, I was I couldn't come up with a name for it, but that's really good. This the quantum face palm is something that hasn't occurred yet, where someone puts a book on their list that not only have I interviewed the author or talked about the book or read and reviewed other books by the author, but I've reviewed that particular book and am blurbed on the paperback. That, that hasn't happened yet, uh, but there. It occurs to me that we're going to need a whole bunch of subcategories, and one of the subcategories is being introduced here now. It's not a face palm so much as it is a throat slit, which is where the person suggests a book in order to try and get Steve in trouble, <laughs> in order to try and get Steve hashtagged. Uh, so maybe we'll call it a hashtag pick, because Kathy Grimm, you know, it's always the nice looking ones. They're always the trouble. <laughs> she does this not once, but twice in her list of books. The first one is this next one, The Beginning of the World in the Middle of the Night, by Booktube's own Jen Campbell, uh, who's a, an extremely benign presence. She has a huge Booktube channel. She has a, a worshipful following. She is, uh, I've never met her, I never will meet her, uh, but she seems like an extremely nice person, extremely thoughtful, extremely intelligent, extremely uh, interesting to listen to when she talks about the books that really move her, or even the books that really annoy her. It's She is, she is I don't want to overgeneralize here, but she is one of the, the so-called big booktubers that is actually worth watching. Most of them are not. Most of them are, are just, you know, I really hate this. It's a job. Uh, they do, you know, a hit of meth and then they shake it off, have a slug of bourbon, and then they turn on the camera and act like Mr. Rogers on meth. And I... <laughs> I don't see the the point of that. I know that none of it is genuine. Those those people, the, the most of those channels, they don't act that way when the camera is off. They hate their audience because they view this as an onerous job. You know, I, it's such a burden to put on this persona. No one had a gun to your head to assume a persona in the first place. You did this all yourself. If you're experiencing burnout because you're a hypocritical a-hole, that's no one's fault but yours. Okay, it's certainly not any reason to do what so many of these larger booktubers have done, which is to refer to the people who got them where they are, with, to the point where they don't need to have a job, as vermin. If you refer to your subscribers as vermin, if you say to your friends, oh, don't feed the trolls, and what you mean is don't even look at the comments on your videos, just interact with your personal friends, then you shouldn't be in this, you shouldn't be doing this at all. You're just adding one more tinny, fake a-hole to the world as if we needed more of those and uh like i mentioned jen campbell doesn't seem to be like that she seems completely genuine in her videos and when she says that she really loves a book i believe it i don't think there's back scratching from other authors or log rolling or sponsorship deals involved i don't think there is a sponsorship in the world that could make her praise something that she didn't like uh and this book the beginning of the world in the middle of the night is by jen campbell and it's a yes. It's a yes. Uh, and I'm not sure that it's a danger of hashtagging, but it is awkward. Uh, because one of the things about this has Steve Reddit little challenge that we're doing uh, is that you expect me to sort of comment on the book. And it feels like a dirty pool to say that I didn't think this book was any good. And I mean any good. I mean, on on a, on a linguist on a rhetorical level, just sentence by sentence, it it was it was competently done, but it is. <laughs> Adam at Memento Mori used to have a channel on BookTube, and uh, as much as so many other things about the book world and about the BookTube world used to irritate the crap out of him, 
the the weaponized sort of heavy-handed forced whimsy that is perfectly embodied in this book used to annoy him i think more than anything <laughs> uh and I, I i in this case i totally agree i i just I it's, it's a very difficult thing because I I trust Jen Campbell I like her videos uh, I never miss one but on some I'm I'm just gonna have to trust you to to sort of know what I'm saying here on one very fundamental level I think the beginning of the world in the middle of the night is a profoundly dishonest book I I I'm glad that I never reviewed it I would never do that I, no matter what no matter what the a great many of those larger booktube channels might prefer i am a part of booktube i'm i'm loving this i'm having a blast i've made a lot of friends this whole challenge arises from the fact that there are hundreds and hundreds of us who have the same sense of humor we're not we're not uh angry or posturing or virtue signaling or faking anything so i'm not going anywhere and there are a great many of jen campbell's friends at the at the deep end of the pool of subscriber counts on booktube who really wish i would even after all this time they don't know anything about me the only thing they know about me is a character assassination rumor rumor mill that happened five years ago <laughs> they, they never watched the video they don't know anything about me at all they don't they've never bothered to email me and ask me you know what did you mean by this in this video or anything like that no excuse not to my video is on every single video my email is on every video that i make and it's readily accessible anyway if you type in steve email to Google, <laughs> it's, it's, I've been I've been open to the rest of the world for quite some time. No one's ever done that. None of these, none of the people who have appeared in Jen Campbell's videos, who she's appeared in their videos, and they keep that going. But I don't think she does. Uh, the one way or another, the the main beef that I have against those people, those larger BookTube channels, is not what they do or do not like about me. <laughs> that would be very predictable and very comforting as a card-carrying, nickel-plated narcissist. It's not that. It's the hypocrisy. I, I I would fault them even if they loved me all the way to the moon and back. It's the hypocrisy that really bothers me. It's the, it's the, the hypocrisy of acting like you're a uh, warm and fuzzy everybody's friend when the camera is rolling to people you call vermin when the camera is not rolling and hate and would prosecute if they approached you in public outside of some meet and greet that you're being paid to attend. That kind of hypocrisy, we won't even verge into the deeper hypocrisy of how much these people actually read. Okay, that got me into a lot of trouble five years ago. I don't have any interest in reprising that. There is a deeper hypocrisy. I, I, but I, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that I, I have all sorts of those negative thoughts and deep-seated fairly well-informed suspicions about a lot of people who have multiple thousand subscribers on on booktube but not jen campbell but i did not like this book at all at all and i it's not just that i disliked it it's that i suspect it and i hate that i hate that feeling anyway i would hate that feeling even if it were an author i knew nothing about it at all and i don't know anything about jen campbell really except what she shared on her videos but i like the person I see on her videos and that makes it worse that makes it worse i would love in, in in some alternate world in which one little comment of mine five years ago had not permanently poisoned the well of people who call themselves open-minded and welcoming in some alternate world where that didn't happen i would love to sit down on a live conversation and talk to jen campbell about these things i bet between the two of us we could probably come to a finer point of what i'm trying to get at it's never going to happen but nevertheless uh, if I'm commenting on the books as we go along here, I'm not, I'm not able to praise this. I wish I could. Uh, uh, let's just move on. The next one is The Very Persistent Gappers of Fripp by booktube darling George Sanders with illustrations by Lane Smith. And this one is a yes. And it's a yes, I suspect, for the same reason that it was a yes for Kathy Grimm. And that is Lane Smith, the illustrator, who I think he's not exactly my favorite illustrator, but I think he is definitely a genius. Oddly, as odd as it may seem, especially in book two, I think he's as much of a genius as George Saunders. Uh, the book I could take or leave, I, again, uh, in, in a very light, related way, it struck me as very false. Uh, I, I don't... It, it, it goes back to a very, a very basic maxim of writing, which is write what you like to read. Don't try to game an audience cynically instead write from the heart 
that those pieces of writing advice are very woolly and very well known. They're cliches, but they're still true. And I didn't get any of that sense at all from George Saunders. Lane Smith, I think, pours his heart and soul into what he draws. But I, I didn't I didn't like the book is what I'm trying to say. But it's still a yes. Uh, we're going to have to hope we get some books here that I do like. The next one is A Year of Swollen Appendices by Brian Eno. Some sort of rock and or roll memoir. It's a no. I've not, I've not read this book. Uh, I, I find it fascinating to listen uh, to the description of it, but I don't think I would ever read it. I don't think I would ever pick it off a shelf at a used bookstore. Uh, so that's a no. Uh, and that is, if I if I recall correctly, that is the first bean. Yes, that is the first bean. Uh, then we move on to The Discovery of Slowness by Sten Nadalny, which is about the, the explorer John Franklin, the Franklin Expedition. But it's about a lot of other things, too. It's got a lot of narrative hijinks, I gather. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, momentum-retarding narrative style designed to make you sort of steep yourself in the book. Uh, and I knew about it when it came out. I saw it, but I have not read it. Uh, if I remember correctly, I could have the dates wrong on all of this, but if I remember correctly, uh, the Discovery of Slowness came out before I got back into book reviewing in 2006. So I think I saw it in the bookstore where I was working and may even have been intrigued by it, but I don't think I borrowed it. I certainly never bought it, and I didn't read it. I, I had a whole network of things that I would do. I would either, if I, when, I was, when I wasn't reviewing, when I couldn't just ask for a copy from a publisher, I would, I would borrow a book from the bookstore. They would often let you do that. They would let, you know, employees do that. Or I would borrow it from the library. My, my bookstore was right around the corner from the Boston Public Library. So I, I would make a note of something during the day and uh, an actual physical note of something during the day. I'd walk around the corner and, you know, see if the library can get me a copy, put one on hold, that sort of thing. Uh, and a bunch of other stuff, a bunch of other ways that I could go about things. Once upon a time, there was a very extensive uh, ARC bookcase just floor to ceiling bookcase down in the bowels of the strand bookstore in new york city incredible arcs that just you know book reviewers that i once was i, I recognized shelves like that immediately you go down into that section once upon a time i think they cracked down on it quite a bit because uh publishers objected uh, i don't even know if the strand is still in business now i'm hoping that they are but it was a great used bookstore in new york city i used to go to new york once a month uh, to visit a friend of mine, and I, w I was a religious observance, you go to the Strand, and I would always go to that wall uh, and just p pick out a whole big tote bag full of ARCs a month ahead, two months ahead, three, five months ahead, uh, for $3 a piece. I would just grab them. I'd grab as many as I could. So there were many ways where I could get in a book without buying it, without paying full price. Even sometimes I did that at the bookstore because I got a hefty discount. Uh, so even if a brand new book came in, paperbacks, oh my god, they were my kryptonite. I got at least one a day. Uh, but because, the, you know, the, you know the, standard, the standard comment, actually Jen Campbell will probably know this comment quite well because she's written a couple of very engaging books about bookshops. Uh, the standard sort of morbid joke from booksellers in retail bookshops is that they spend their whole paycheck in the store. <laughs> that, was, uh, that wasn't always true for me, but there was a tithe coming out every day at least. But uh, I never did get this, and I never have since. I just, I haven't played catch-up too much with the books that came out that I missed during the years when I wasn't reviewing. And I think that's part of the motivation, part of the fire that makes me very much not want to miss anything now. Because there were years when I did, and it, and it bothered me. Would, now it bothered me much more, but, but it, it bothered me even then. Uh, but I never have, so this is a no. So, uh, so... Uh, Kathy Grimm is up to two beans. And keep in mind, those of you keeping score at home, two beans was the, the uh, top score for a long time. We're, the top score now is three beans. Jim's books, reading, and stuff got three beans. So that's the total that Kathy Grimm has to beat, and she doesn't have two more entries to do it, but she is at two now, so she's well poised. So let's see what she has next. <laughs> the next one is Gender Trouble by Judith Butler. And uh, you will recall earlier in this in this video, I mentioned the concept of the face palm. This is Kathy Grimm's face palm. <laughs> Obviously, this is her face palm. Not only did this book come out when I was reviewing new releases and reading everything new, but also it is a hand grenade. It is it is for good or ill. In this case, entirely ill. Uh, a foundational text of the Crimea River 21st century, of the facts-denying, reality-denying 21st century. 
where you make up your own reality. It, it, it's true even in Judith Butler herself, who wants you to call her by a plural pronoun. She is a woman. She is demonstrably, factually, anatomically, physiologically a woman. She is a she. She is a her. She's not a they. She's not a them. Even then, even there, and that little bit right there, that little diatribe comment that I just made, shows that this is another subcategory that Kathy Grimm has done once again. Not only is this her face palm, because of course I have read Gender Trouble, uh, but this is also another hashtag because she wants to get me in trouble by commenting about Gender Trouble. I could comment about Gender Trouble for an hour and a half. I will only say a couple of things. Number one, Kathy Grimm in her video almost seems to imply to her viewers, you, because you should subscribe to her if you don't already, she almost seems to imply that Gender Trouble is well written. It most certainly is not. It is garbage in terms of just its prose line. It is virtually unreadable. Virtually unreadable in almost every paragraph. It's torture to read. So that's, that's one comment that I'll make. And the other comment that I'll make, I'll keep it very brief. I promise not to go on a 30-minute rant. I, pro I was walking Frida when I saw this. <clears throat> when I saw this video, Kathy's, I watched it, and then I took Frida on a walk. And that, during that walk, I was telling myself, when you get to this point, do not rant for 30 minutes. And I am not going to rant for 30 minutes. So I will say, number one, this is torture to read. It is a horribly, horribly written book. And two... It is almost completely false. Almost all of the contentions that it makes, cloaked in academies, are lies. And I say lies instead of errors because Judith Butler knows perfectly well they are lies. I know that the, f the fad in the 21st century is that if you don't like reality, instead of adapting, you just say reality's wrong. I know that's the fad. This book is one of the foundational texts of that movement. And that movement could not be any more dangerous. It is eventually going to come to harm every single one of us. It could not be any more dangerous. And this is one of the foundational texts. Most of, and I mean 99.9% .9 of the claims in this book are factually wrong. Those are the two things that I will say. I will not rant for 30 minutes. I will only say it's agony to read and it's a lie. Almost entirely a lie. As anyone who has ever had a child, seen children, had a human friend, or read about humans would know. <laughs> the only people who claim, who act, who lie about not knowing the lies in this book are the people who want to make a buck by denying reality. By saying, you, you, you over there in the back, me, my mother, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, ten generations removed, all knew the basic fact that I am now going to use academic prose to claim isn't true at all. It never has been true. <laughs> so, <coughs> oh, goodness. We have more bed making. I thought you were done making your bed. And you were doing it again. <laughs> what? Oh, Bean, you can't keep doing this. <laughs> You'd rather see this than listen to me anyway. Baby, that's just a pillow. It's not going to work. Oh, oh goodness. Oh my goodness. What are you doing? That's not going to go anywhere. Oh, oh baby. Oh, no, baby bean, that's not going to help. Oh. <laughs> oh, baby. Well, that was a that was a perfectly adorable uh, point to end my little rant. I will I will end my little rant rather than continue it. I promised myself that I would not talk about this one incredibly poisonous book for thirty or forty minutes at a stretch, and I've already started along those lines. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. Gender trouble is a yes and a face palm and a hashtag. <laughs> okay, so so Kathy Graham is making a lot of trouble in this video. I said. It's always the mild-mannered ones. <laughs> but anyway, then we'll move on to her last choice. And this is Love Across Color Lines. And this is, this, uh, it's by Maria Diedrich, and it's the story of Ottilie Assing 
and Frederick Douglass, who had a kind of a fraught, charged, mostly epistolary relationship. Uh, and this is a no. I read about this in the, the there's a great biography of Frederick Douglass that I that I, I got. I think it was number one on my biography list that year. I've praised the daylights out of it. I, it has a large amount about this relationship, but I haven't read this book. This book is just about that. Uh, I guess because I don't find the subject interesting enough as an aspect of Douglas's life, I find a lot of other aspects of his life a lot more interesting than this one. I think I probably know at heart pretty much what this relationship was, and it doesn't reflect well on either one of them. That isn't the reason that I would avoid it, but that is the reason that makes it sort of uh, sordid and twittery. Uh, but one way or another, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe the book is is very good and worthwhile scholarship. I just haven't got to it. And again, I think this is probably one of those kinds of books that I'm never going to see used. <clears throat> but one way or another, one way or another, it's a no. And that means, for those of you keeping score at home, uh, that the Grim Reader has three beans. Which means that we now have, we are now in, this, in a state where, oddly enough, in a quantum reality type thing, we have no winners and no losers in season two of Has Steve Read It. We have two people at the very bottom drowning their sorrows in their cheap beer, and we have two people at the very top at three beans. We don't have one winner and one loser at all anymore. We're in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle of the second season of Has Steve Read It, which means the door is open for further entries and the invitation is wide out there because we need someone to either, well, well, to take either spot, I was going to say nobody would want to be the ultimate loser. But so far, nobody has come along and had zero beans, right? Nobody has done that. And nobody has even broke the halfway point. Good Lord. Much less got eight beans. So the door is wide open. We have plenty of other contestants. I think if I were to do one of these a day, I could do one all week. And if I can, I will, because I'm having a blast. This is just so much fun. Where else would we talk about half the books that came up on these list or any others? Every one of these lists is is bringing up books that nobody ever talks about on book two, and it's so much fun to do. Uh, so I'm going to keep doing it, uh, and we will hope that someday soon someone breaks the legendary four bean barrier, the sound barrier, as he read it season two. Surely someone can do it. Perhaps, perhaps a returning champ of a kind. Perhaps uh, a heavy hitter from season one maybe needs to come back. Plenty of them have not. Plenty of them could. One way or another, this was so much fun, I will be back. <laughs> Thank you, book two.